Electric World, Harnessing Weapons of Mac Destruction. Why write your own malware when you can simply repair past existing specimens? We illustrate the process of weapons in existing macOS, malware such as romanceware, scripto miners, and backdoors for unsurreptitious purpose. All right, good morning, and welcome to my talk about harnessing weapons of Mac destruction. So, I'm Patrick, uh, creator of Objective C, also a former co founder of Digital Security. Currently, I work at Jamf. So, today we're going to be talking about repurposing other people's Mac malware for our own surreptitious purposes. We'll start by showing why this is rather an excellent idea and then show exactly how to repurpose various Mac specimens. Now, of course, we want our repurposed malware to remain undetected by both Apple's built-in malware mitigations and third-party antivirus products, so we'll address that as well. Finally, we'll end by covering some methods that can generically detect macOS threats including these repurposed samples, because ultimately we want to make sure that Mac users remain secure. So let's dive in. So here we have a diagrammatic overview that conceptually explains the repurposing process. So imagine Spy A has developed some neat, sophisticated, fully featured Mac malware and has deployed it to various computers around the world. Somehow, Spy B is able to capture this malware, perhaps in transit or even off an infected system. Spy B then will take this malware that was created by Spy A into her lab and then repurposes it. So what does repurposing a piece of malware actually mean? Well, we'll get into this more shortly, but essentially you can think of it as reconfiguring the malware often at the binary level, so that you can use it for your own purpose, your own, perhaps, offensive cyber espionage operations. So for example, as we can see on the slide, when Spy B now goes to redeploy this repurposed malware, it'll now connect to her command and control servers for tasking, instead of, of course, Spy A's. Now you might be thinking, all right, this is neat, uh, but why would you do this? And actually, there's two reasons which will hopefully show us that we, we really should be asking, why not? So first, if we think about it, there are incredibly well-funded, well-resourced, very motivated hackers, APT groups, and even three-letter agencies that are creating very amazing, very comprehensive, very fully tested malware that they're already deploying and utilizing in the wild. Honestly, I'm somewhat lazy. I'd rather be sleeping or surfing as opposed to writing my own malware. So I figured, why not let these groups, these agencies, create these very complicated, sophisticated pieces of malware, and then we can just repurpose them for our own mission. The idea is basically let those with more time and more money do all the hard work, and then we can kind of just piggyback off that. Second, if our repurposed malware creations are ever detected, ever get caught, it's likely they will be misattributed to the original authors, which for us is really good. We'll likely never get blamed. Okay, you say, Patrick, this seems like a reasonably good idea, but if it's such a good idea, why aren't others already doing it? Well, the answer is they are. We just have to look closely. So I can't really comment on this, but leaked slides appear to show that the NSA has such capabilities. And recent reporting from the New York Times also confirms that the Chinese APT or government hacking groups are doing this as well. Now, to these well-resourced agencies, the benefit of using repurposed malware is twofold. First, it allows them to deploy malware, other countries' malware that they've repurposed, into risky environments. So imagine you're the NSA, you've hacked a high-value target, and you find the Russians or the Chinese have also hacked that. Right? You're not going to put your primary, your own custom implant on that box. It's just too risky because the other adversaries might detect what you've installed and capture it. However, if you used a repurposed piece of malware that was written by another country, there's really no risk there. There's nothing really lost if you get detected. 
Also, we mentioned attribution, right? So for example, again, if the NSA or the Chinese are using repurposed malware and it's eventually detected by an antivirus company or the target themselves, it's going to be very difficult to attribute back. It's likely going to be misattributed to the original authors, not those that repurposed it. Now, of course, there's challenges to repurposing malware. If it was trivial, we wouldn't be talking about this today. But I'm going to show you these challenges are really not insurmountable. So first, generally speaking, source code for the malware samples that you are going to repurpose is not going to be available. Meaning we're going to have to reverse engineer the malware and then patch or modify it at the binary level. Now, when we're studying the malware, this is what I like to call the analysis stage. And the goal here is trying to understand the malware fairly comprehensively to answer questions such as, how does it persist? How does it communicate? Then, once we have this understanding, what we can do is we can generally go ahead and, for example, start building a custom command and control server if the malware connects out and expects tasking. Now, as I mentioned, we don't have source code, so we're going to have to do the patching at the binary level. This is not the easiest thing to do, but we'll show it's also not that difficult. And then finally, and we'll talk about this later, as we're generally repurposing known malware or malware that has been publicly captured and perhaps analyzed already, it's likely there are third-party AV signatures or Apple signatures for it as well. So we need to make sure that our repurposed samples aren't detected because it would be very unfortunate if we went to deploy a nicely repurposed piece of malware and Apple or an AV product flagged it. Now, I want to reiterate, it's fairly important to get these challenges correct, because if you don't, maybe bad things will happen. So here, for example, perhaps we've attempted to repurpose a piece of Mac malware. Turns out, though, we forgot to modify, to repurpose, to patch out the addresses of the backup command and control server. This means the hacker's original CNC adders are still embedded in the malware. This is less than ideal because if it means we deploy what we believe to be a fully repurposed malware specimen, in some scenarios, perhaps if our servers go offline for a short amount of time, this repurposed sample will still beacon back to the original hacker, giving him or her access to all our new targets. This is not ideal. Here we have another real world example. Now, in this case, the hacker didn't actually fully repurpose the malware but rather simply planted it to fake attribution. So a student that was actually caught changing her grades could claim there was no way she did it because her computer was hacked. However, the samples that the student or the, the hacker she was working, in, working with together planted some rather implausible samples that they actually downloaded from my website. So the student said, no, this couldn't have been me. I couldn't have done this because my computer is infected. And specifically, look, there's two pieces of malware on here, one called Coldroot and another called Crossrat. And a lot of people said, OK, this is somewhat plausible. But if we stop to think about this, this is completely not realistic. First and foremost, Coldroot is a proof of concept Mac malware sample that doesn't even run on recent versions of Mac OS. So again, the student said, oh, I'm infected with Coldroot. You're like, no, this malware doesn't even run. The second instance that was planted on her system that she claimed proved her innocence was something called Crossrat. This was developed by the Lebanese government to spy and to be utilized in cyber espionage campaigns. It's never going to end up in a student's computer in the US who's studying to be a vet. So again, if you're repurposing malware, you've got to take into account some level of plausibility. All right, so now let's talk about exactly how we're going to repurpose Mac malware with the goal of making other people's malware our own. So the first step to repurpose a piece of malware is to select the specimen that you want to repurpose. Basically, there is two criteria. The first is you need to decide what you want the malware to do. Are you looking for an interactive backdoor? a piece of ransomware, or perhaps a persistent cryptocurrency miner. Second, perhaps attribution is important to you. Are you looking for a sample that will likely be misattributed back to a US intelligence agency, or perhaps a Russian hacking group? 
So on my website, ObjectiveC.com, I have a very comprehensive collection of Mac malware, so that's a great place to start. And I want to note that all these samples we will be repurposing today, the original specimens are available for download. So if you want to go and play and kind of walk through some of these examples, you can get the malware from my site. Okay, so now you've selected a piece of malware, uh, it's time to analyze it. As we mentioned in terms of repurposing or reconfiguring a sample, the main goals of this analysis include things like uncovering any logic that involves remote interaction, right? You'll want to figure out if the malware is talking to a command and control server and where it's getting the address of that command and control server because likely that's something you will want to patch out and modify. So now it instead talks to your servers. If the malware does talk to a command and control server for tasking, you'll want to understand that logic. For example, that protocol so again, you can remotely task it once you redeploy it to new systems. And of course, you'll fully want to understand the malware's capabilities, both the local ones, how it persists, how it interacts with the system, and then also the remote capabilities. That is, what commands it can support so when you task it, you know what the malware is able to do. So once you have a comprehensive understanding of the malware, it's actually time to now repurpose or reconfigure it. Generally, this means we're going to patch the malware, often at the binary level. So here, for example, we're looking at a piece of malware that we want to reconfigure, and we've located the addresses of the command and control server directly in the malware's binary. So what we can do is we can simply modify these bytes to change the address to our own server, which means when we redeploy this now repurposed malware, when it infects a system and connects out, it'll now connect to our command and control address for tasking. As we mentioned, if the malware or backdoor uh, or implant expects uh, to talk to a command and control server, we're gonna have to write a custom one, unless we've somehow captured the original command and control server as well, but that's generally less likely. So we need to do this so that we can ensure that when our repurposed malware, which connects to our command and control server, we can have a custom command and control server that speaks the protocol that the malware is expecting. Now, this doesn't have to be anything fancy. I generally just create uh, a Python script, uh, but if you're planning to deploy this repurposed malware to a large number of systems, you might need something more comprehensive. DEF CON a few years ago, I talked about creating a custom command and control server for the purpose of analyzing a malware sample versus redeploying it. But that is a good talk that shows exactly how to go into creating a fully featured command and control server that can talk to someone else's malware. Okay, so now let's look through, uh, walk through some actual examples of repurposing some Mac malware. We're gonna start with Fruitfly. It's a very good one to kind of introduce this topic to. Uh, Fruitfly is rather unique. Uh, it was initially developed over 15 years ago but remained undetected and fully functional uh, until quite recently. It's a fully featured backdoor that supports a myriad of capabilities, which makes it a perfect candidate for us to reconfigure. As we'll see, it's very easy for us to reconfigure this malware, and that gives us a proven, fully featured backdoor that we can utilize in our own offensive cyber operations. Way, way simpler than writing our own from scratch. Fruitfly is actually written uh, in Perl. It's a Perl script, though it's rather highly obfuscated. If we take a peek at the back door to kind of reverse engineer and understand how it works, we can see that the, the Perl script, the malware, is actually looking for various command line arguments and then will ingest and process those. And it turns out what it's looking for is either a port or an IP port combo of a command and control server. This means we can simply pass in our own command and control server address and port via the command line without actually having to modify the malware. This is great. This is incredibly trivial. So for example, as we can see on the slide, when we now go to persist this malware sample on new targets that we've compromised, we can simply specify our own address, our own command and control server, and the malware, whenever it executes, will now connect and talk to us. So we can trivially repurpose Fruitfly now and have it connect to our custom command and control server. But to deploy this, we need an installer because the original malware's installer was never actually recovered. 
Good news, I wrote one. It's available on Pastebin. And as we can see, it's a few lines of Python code. Really nothing fancy. We don't have to overthink this. Basically, it persists the malware in a manner as it was detected in the wild. So if anyone comes across this new infection, it'll look exactly like it did on the other scenarios. Finally, I had previously written a custom command and control server, as I mentioned, so I just went ahead and reused this. And we're going to see a brief demo. On the right of the screen, uh, rather on the left, we'll see the Fruitfly installer. And we'll see a connection that, when it's installed, connect out to our command and control server on the right. So we first start the command and control server. We then run the installer, which is going to install the repurposed malware. It's going to beacon out, and these are the available commands we can task. We're going to say, please take a screen capture. This is one of the commands that the malware supports. And the malware is then going to take a screen capture and send it back to us. We then, on the command and control server, which is also running on the same test box as the malware infection, we then open the screenshot. So we can see now we have generated a screenshot by simply sending the command to the repurposed malware. We didn't have to write any code. This is great. So now let's repurpose a cryptocurrency miner. Is perhaps you're more interested in making millions of dollars, but don't want to spend all your time and effort actually writing your own sample from scratch. So our target is Creative Update. This is a cryptocurrency miner that was spread uh, via Trojan to applications from the popular website MacUpdate.com. If we mount the malicious disk image that contains one of these Trojan applications and reverse engineer the malware, we can see it invoking a method named execute script with privileges. And what this method does is simply execute a file named script out of the application's resource directory. So let's take a peek at this script to see what it's doing. We can see what it does is it first launches a pristine copy of the application it trojaned. Here, for example, Firefox. And it does this so that the user doesn't see anything is amiss. Right? They're expecting this to be Firefox, so it makes sense when the malware runs, it launches Firefox. Right? It then connects out to a server, downloads a zip archive named mdworker.zip and then persistently install something named mdworker out of this downloaded zip file. Looking at the launch agent plist, or property list, that's persisted by the malware, we can see the path to the persistent binary, which is this mdworker file, as well as some command line arguments that are passed to this binary. So if we execute this md worker binary, perhaps in a VM, to analyze it, we can see it's actually a legitimate crypto miner that belongs to a company named MinerGate. The args, therefore, specify the miner account, that is, where to send the mining results, and the type of cryptocurrency. So again, what the hackers did is they took an application like Firefox, they trojanized it to add this persistent cryptocurrency miner, and then uploaded it to a popular website. This means any time a user went to this website to download Firefox, they would get Firefox, but then a persistent cryptocurrency miner would also be installed in the background. So similar to Fruitfly, since the relevant parameters are passed in via the command line, as say opposed to being directly embedded into the binary, it's very trivial for us to repurpose this malware to turn it into something that will cryptocurrency mine for us. So first we modify the property list file and we specify our own miner account. We then zip up the malware's contents into an archive. Now instead of having the malware reach out to a download server to download that archive, we just embed it directly into the Trojan app's resource bundle. This just simplifies everything. We don't have to stand up a download server. We then tweak the script so instead it utilizes the zip archive we've just added. Finally, we repackage everything up into a DMG, and we're ready now to redeploy this to infect new systems and now install the repurposed, reconfigured cryptocurrency miner. So again, here's a brief demo. We're basically going to see us opening or executing the repurposed cryptocurrency miner. So first, nothing seems amiss. We execute Firefox.app. Firefox pops up. This is cool, this is expected. But in the background, if we go and look, we can see that there has been a, a persistent launch agent that is installed that will execute this MD worker, which again, recall, is the actual cryptocurrency miner binary. 
And if we look closely at the command line arguments, since we've reconfigured it, it'll now send all the cryptocurrency mining results to my account. So if I deployed this to a variety of systems, I would now start raking in the money with, again, not having to write a single line of code. All right, let's keep on with the idea of making money. I think we all like to do that. So perhaps you want to deploy some ransomware without, again, spending, spending any time running your own. So here we'll talk through how to re repurpose uh, KeyRanger. KeyRanger was the first fully functional, uh, in-the-wild piece of ransomware that targeted Mac OS. What hackers did, again, they infected a popular website, specifically the developer's website for the transmission BitTorrent client, which means that when users went to the developer's website to download transmission, instead of getting a pristine copy, they would get an infected, trojanized copy that would contain this piece of ransomware. If we look at the malware's binary code, we can see it executing something named general.rtf out of the application bundle. Now, general.rtf general is generally a document, but in this scenario, it's actually a malicious Mako executable. So what this binary does, this general.rtf binary, it first sleeps for a few days, and then connects out to a remote command and control server, expecting a response consisting of a public RSA encryption key and decryption instructions. It then uses that public RSA key to encrypt all the user's files, and once that is completed, displays the decryption uh, instructions to the users demanding a ransom. Yeah, it's ransomware. So now let's talk about repurposing this ransomware so we can use it for our own surreptitious purposes. First and foremost, we don't want to wait three days. We're kind of greedy. We want the money, the ransomware, to happen right away. So what we can do is we can simply patch out or knop out the sleep function. And we can see that on the slide. We basically just replace the binary instructions with NOP instructions. This means now the malware won't sleep. It'll immediately connect out to the command and control server for uh, the encryption key and the decryption instructions. So now we have to find the address of that embedded command and control server and change it to point to our server. As obviously we want this malware to connect to us so we can give it our encryption key and our decryption instructions. As we can see on the slides, uh, the address of this command and control server is directly embedded within the binary. So we simply go in and in a hex editor and change those bytes. Here we change them to localhost uh, 127.0.0.1 for testing purposes. Now, we need a server because, again, recall the ransomware, when it connects out, expects a public uh, RSA encryption key and also decryption instructions. This turns out very, very simple to do. We basically put the expected response the public RSA key, our public RSA key, and the decryption instructions in a text file, and then we can actually just serve this up via Netcat. This now means anytime any of these repurposed uh, ransomware samples connect to our server, which is really just a Netcat listener, the correct response will be sent down to the malware. So again, here's a demo of KeyRanger fully repurposed. We'll see it connect out to our command and control servers because we've patched the binary to talk to us. And we're going to provide it with our public RSA key and the decryption instructions. So launch the malware, it just runs, it connects out, and we can see it starting to encrypt all the files. For example, all the slides I have on the desktop. And you can imagine on a user system, this would be their photos, their tax returns, perhaps you know, their research, things that they're really bummed about if they get encrypted. We can then see that when the malware is uh, fully complete, when it's encrypted all the files, it displays the decryption instructions. Again, these are sent by us to the system. So we can pop up, and as we can see here, we say, please send all your money to Patrick. You know, obviously, you probably should use an anonymized email address, uh, but the point is we can now provide our own decryption instructions and tell the user where to send the money so that we will decrypt the files. All right, finally, we have Wintail. Uh, this is the last uh, Mac malware sample we're going to talk about repurposing. Uh, Wintel is, is lovely. It was written by a rather sophisticated uh, APT group that was targeting individuals of a Middle Eastern government. So fairly sophisticated uh, backdoor used in cyber espionage operations. We're going to see that we're going to be able to repurpose both their exploit and their backdoor. Again, this is great. This gives us this really comprehensive, advanced, sophisticated Mac implant and exploit that we can utilize for our own purposes without actually having to write anything from scratch. 
Now, one of the most interesting aspects uh, of this malware was its infection vector. And the way it got onto Mac systems was by abusing a legitimate feature of Mac OS called custom URL schemes. Now, I've written a very detailed blog if you're interested in all the low-level technical details. But suffice to say, on Mac OS, any time an application hits the file system, if it registers or if it contains any handlers for custom URL schemes, Mac OS will automatically register those. And then once the URL scheme has been registered to the file system, you can now launch the application by making a request to that custom URL scheme, for example, via the browser. In terms of the back door, uh, it persists as a login item and supports capabilities such as file collection and file exfiltration. If we run a process monitor, we can see, as we show on the slide, that we can see the malware utilizing macOS's built-in zip utility to compress collected files, and then it uploads them to the APT group server via the curl command. The backdoor also supports a file download capability. Uh, if we reverse engineer the malware and we look at its SDF method, we can see it decrypts the address of an embedded command and control server and then makes an initial request to get a name of the file that it's about to download, and then makes a second request to get the actual contents of the file to save to the system. If we fire up a network monitor, we can see it making these two requests. And if you look on the slide, you can see the address of the decrypted command and control server, flux2key.com. This will come up again shortly, because obviously we will want to change this, so the malware will talk to our servers instead. The backdoor will also execute then this downloaded file. If we look at more disassembly in this SDF method, we can see that it'll unzip it to the library directory and then execute it via NSTask API. So again, this malware supports a download and execute capability. Finally, the backdoor also contains some self-delete logic that can be remotely triggered. This is actually kind of a cool capability. What happens is every, the, every time the malware starts up, it spawns a background thread that connects the command and control server to a certain API endpoint. And if that API endpoint returns a 1, this is the self-destruct command for the malware. And what the malware will do, it'll first uninstall itself and then terminate. All right, so now we have a pretty good understanding of the back door, both how it works, how it gets on the system, and what its capabilities are. So let's go ahead and repurpose it so we can utilize it in our own offensive cyber operations. So first thing, let's talk about repurposing the exploit. What we do, it's pretty simple to create a, a malicious web page that will auto-download something when the user visits. And Safari kindly will auto-extract any zip file. Recall, as we mentioned, if the item we're downloading in the zip file that's auto-extracted by Safari, again, that's a feature, uh, contains a custom URL handler, Mac OS will automatically register that handler for us. We can then trigger the launch of that malware via request to that custom URL. And if the user clicks Allow, this will launch the malware, and the system will now be fully infected. So here's a brief demo. We're going to see the repurpose exploit. The user has gone to this website. This is a pop-up from Safari. And if the user clicks on Open here, we can now see that the system is fully infected. And for example, we can go in and we can see that the malware has persisted as a login item. So now we have the ability to redeploy this using this APT group's uh, exploit. Again, very trivial to repurpose to install our own payload. We're going to use the same implant backdoor as they do, but it's going to be reconfigured and repurposed. So it'll connect to us for tasking. So step one, we must modify the addresses of the command and control server so it connects to us so that we can task it. Right? We don't want it connecting back to the original attackers. That would just be lame. However, there's a problem, and this is that the embedded addresses are encrypted. So we can't just open up a text editor and change them to our own addresses. But not to worry. What we can do is we can utilize some runtime decryption to decrypt the command and control servers before the malware actually uses them. So what we can do is we can coerce the malware to load an external library that we package up into the malware. And we can see on the slide that, yes, indeed, our dynamic library has been loaded any time the malware executes. So now what we want to do, as I mentioned, is we want to decrypt or allow the malware to decrypt the command and control addresses and then swap them out before the malware actually utilizes them to determine where to connect out. 
So what our dynamic library does is swap out the malware addresses, uh, the malware's uh, decryption function so that we can swap out these command and control servers. And we do this via something called swizzling, which is accomplished via a powerful Apple API method underscore exchange implementation. So we can see on the slide, once we've swapped out the decryption routine, any time any piece of code in the malware calls into the decryption routine, for example, to decrypt the address of the command and control server, our code in our dynamically, dynamic library transparently gets invoked. So what we do is we call back into the malware's original decryption routine. I don't know how it's decrypting the strings, and frankly, I don't care. But then we get to see the response of that, and we can see if it's the command and control server addresses, we don't return those back to the malware, we simply swap those out with our own. So we can see that on the slide. So I added some debugging messages to the library. So now if we execute the repurpose backdoor, it's going to load in our additional dynamic library. That dynamic library is going to replace or swap out the malware's decryption function. When the malware then goes to invoke the decryption routine, for example, to decrypt strings or the command and control addresses, our code will intercept that. We check to see if it's a command and control server address, and if it is, we just return our own. And we can see that at the very bottom in the terminal output, instead of returning the flux to key, which is the addresses the original hackers used, we returned our server.com. Of course, this would be any server. This is where your command and control server. This means now when you go to deploy this repurpose malware, it'll connect to your command and control server instead of the hacker's original one. Now, we still have to write a custom command and control server because this repurpose malware is now going to connect to us and ask for tasking. So we have to understand how to respond to it so it'll do our own bidding. Now, the main feature of Wintail, as I mentioned, is file exfiltration. So that's the first capability we're going to add to our server. If we analyze the malware, we can see that when it attempts to exfiltrate these files, it simply does this via a POST request. So this is very easy for us to uh, support on the back end. In our Python command and control server, we simply save any POST results that the malware sends to us. So here's a demo. This is our custom command and control server, and we can see these repurposed malware when, when APT backdoors are now connecting to us and are exfiltrating files via post requests. So on the other side of the screen in the smaller finder window, we can see that our Python script is just saving the exfiltrated files out to a directory. So now we support the ability, and now all the exfiltrated files from infected systems uh, all over the world where we've redeployed this malware to are going to be sending files to us, and we're saving them off to our own server for analysis. We also want to extend our custom command and control server to support the ability to download and execute new files on the system. So we noted the malware makes two requests. First, it connects to the server to get the name of the file, and then makes a second request to download that actual file. So again, the malware will then download whatever we specify and execute it. Turns out we only need about 10 lines of code to add to our custom command and control server to support this functionality. So again, here's a demo, let's watch in action. We'll see the repurpose malware connect out to our custom command and control server, and then it will download and execute the calculator.app. So first, there's the initial connection, connects out, we say please download and execute calculator. Malware does that. So now we have the ability to remotely download and execute uh, any file to any of these repurposed malware systems. Uh, which is great because this allows us to install other tools or perhaps even another piece of malware. So a very powerful capability to support. Finally, let's also make the malware support uh, the remote uh, self-delete command uh, because at some point, you know, maybe the FBI will show up on your door and start knocking. Uh, so it'd be really great to simply press a button and have all these repurposed uh, malware infections all over the world simply self-delete. And then you can say, ah, I, I didn't do anything, right? It uh, turns out it's pretty easy to support this functionality. As we mentioned, the malware, every time it starts up, connects out and looks for uh, a response. Basically, should I self-delete? So if we respond to this and say yes, returning a one, the malware will uninstall and terminate. So here we have another demo of that. 
Uh, again, this is a repurposed sample that we've redeployed. If you look on the screen, you can see that orange final presentation icon. That is how the malware installs itself. It's not the stealthiest, but this is in a hidden system directory, so the average user is not going to be poking around. We'll see, though, that when it connects out, and at the bottom we have our custom command and control server, we are going to give it the self-delete command. That file will be removed, and then the malware will stop beaconing, because obviously we've told it just to exit. So we start our command and control server, beacons out. We say, yes, please self-delete. The malware gets that, deletes itself, and then exits. So now this remote system is fully clean, fully un uh, uninstalled, and hopefully there's no forensics evidence to prove that we either, ever uh, actually infected that system. Okay, so we've showed exactly how to repurpose a myriad of Mac malware, uh, from backdoors to ransomware to cryptocurrency miners. However, we need to talk about remaining undetected, as generally speaking, we are repurposing known malware samples, which means both Mac OS, Apple, and third-party AV products will likely block or detect these samples, which would suck. So first up, we have Mac OS's built-in uh, malware mitigation, such as XProtect, uh, the malware removal tool, and code signing certificate checks. At first glance, Glance, these all appear to be rather problematic for us if we're redeploying uh, reconfigured malware uh, because these exist on all Mac computers. These are built in. So if they're blocking our malware samples, this means we can't infect any Macs. So let's talk about how to bypass these because if we want to redeploy a reconfigured or repurposed piece of malware, it'd really suck if it, if it was blocked by Apple. So first up, we have XProtect. This is a simple signature-based AV scanner that's actually built into all versions of macOS. So yes, macOS has a built-in antivirus scanner. It's rather limited. It only scans files downloaded by the user the first time it's executed. The detection signatures that XProtect uses are located in a system file called xprotect.yara. And we can see if we dump these signatures, there is one for KeyRanger. Again, this is the repurposed ransomware sample we are going to deploy. Since XProtect, though, is purely signature-based, turns out it's trivial to bypass. So if we take a closer look for that KeyRanger sample, which would detect even our repurposed binary and block it, meaning we can't actually repurpose it, uh, we can see that it's simply matching on a certain sequence of instructions. So knowing this, to bypass the signature, we can simply reorder or modify any of these instructions by changing various bytes. This will, of course, cause the signature to no longer match, which will mean the malware will be allowed to execute. So here, for example, we change the number of bytes that may be written to a buffer from OX400 to OX300. This won't impact the malware's functionality at all, but will change the malware just enough, that one byte change, to ensure that the signature no longer hits and that the malware will now no longer be detected by XProtect. So again, another demo. We have two instances of KeyRanger. On the left, we're going to have the original sample. On the right is our repurposed sample that also has this one byte modification. So we're going to see the user executes the first sample, and it's blocked. Mac OS says this is infected, and the only option you have is move to trash or cancel. However, if we execute the second one, it's going to say, this is an application from the internet. Are you sure you want to execute? And if you do, it'll be allowed to run and will persistently install the ransomware. Great. Now on to code signing checks. Most binaries on Mac OS are code signed. Signed binaries are not blocked by Gatekeeper. Thus, a lot of Mac malware is now code signed. A downside from the attacker or from the malware's point of view is once the malware has been detected, Apple can revoke the cert, which means that the malware will now not run on any new systems. Here, for example, we can see the Wintail backdoor. Its code sign certificate has been revoked from Apple, which means if you take Wintail and try to run it on a new system, even if you've tricked the user into visiting your web page and your exploit has successfully fired, Mac OS will actually block it saying, hey, this code signing certificate has been revoked. That's problematic for us. Of course, we want our repurposed sample to run. Now, the problem, though, is just that revoked code signing certificate, not the malware per se. So what we can do is we can simply re remove that code signing certificate and then either distribute the repurposed malware unsigned 
or re-sign it with another legitimate developer code signing certificate. Pretty easy to get. So first thing we need to do is unsign the malware to get rid of that revoked code signing certificate. Turns out you can use Apple's code sign utility. There's an undocumented flag, dash dash remove signature. This will then remove that revoked signature. The malware will now be able to run, although it's still unsigned. To blend in and bypass Gatekeeper, we want to re-sign it. And again, we can use the code sign utility passing the dash S flag. So now our repurposed re-signed Wintail will no longer be blocked by Mac OS. Finally, we have MRT. This is the malware removal tool. This is another AV-like tool that's built into Mac OS. It's uh, similar to Xprotect scans for malware, but we'll scan your entire system, and if any of its signatures match, it'll delete that. So again, we don't want to run into that. We don't want MRT to detect our repurposed malware, because otherwise Apple will go ahead and delete it from all the systems that we've infected. Now, unlike Xprotect, MRT signatures are directly embedded into the MRT binary. They're not in some external property list or uh, Yara file. You can also see, as an interesting aside, that Apple also uses MRT from time to time to remove vulnerable third-party code. For example, the popular video chat application Zoom had a remotely exploitable vulnerability. Apple decided to basically remove that from Macs around the world by using MRT. Now, since MRT, like Xprotect, uses signatures, albeit its signatures are embedded into the binary, it's very trivial to bypass MRT so that it doesn't, in, doesn't detect our repurposed samples. So if we dump the MRT binary, we can, for example, see there's a signature for Fruitfly, which is one of the samples we talked about earlier, how to repurpose and redeploy. So if we examine the signature, we can see it's looking for and detecting Fruitfly based on both the path of the malware and the name of its launch agent plist. This means when we redeploy the malware, as long as we change either the path or the name of the property list, MRT will no longer detect that. So this is very trivial to do. All right, you just rename the malware, it won't be detected. I also briefly want to mention bypassing third-party AV products because there are a decent number of users that are now running third-party antivirus products on your Mac. Again, it would rather suck if your repurposed malware made it onto a new system and then the antivirus product that was there detected that. That would be unfortunate. Now, there's been a lot of talk about that, uh, how to bypass AV products, so we're not going to really dive into it here. But suffice to say, especially on Mac, most third-party AV products are signature-based, which means they're trivial to bypass. So, for example, I took Fruitfly, which, recall, is written in Perl. I ran it through a free online Perl de ob obfuscator, and then re-uploaded it to VirusTotal, and none of the AV engines on VirusTotal detected it anymore. Now, that's a very basic example. There's other more sophisticated ways to bypass AV products. Uh, for example, you could use a packer, custom encryptor, or even execute it directly out of memory. Uh, I gave a talk about this at Black Hat a few years ago, so if you're interested in bypassing third-party AV products, check out that talk. All right, so for Mac users, this all kind of sucks, right? I mean, we showed advanced adversaries are already utilizing repurposed malware. And actually, it's pretty straightforward to do that, right? We just talked about how anybody can take these existing Mac malware and repurpose them and then utilize them for your own subversive purposes. And unfortunately, the majority of existing detections and protection mechanisms, both on Mac OS uh, and third-party ones, are generally going to fail. They're not going to detect these threats. And in my opinion, this is, this is kind of lame because if you think about it, these repurposed samples are functionally exactly the same as the original. They have the same behavior, right? If we're deploying a piece of ransomware, even if we've reconfigured it, it's still going to encrypt files. So even though some bytes are the same, it's essentially exactly the same piece of malware. So there's really no reason why tools should not be able to detect that. So let's briefly talk about how to generically detect such threats. First, and this is a well-known fact, uh, detecting malware based on signatures is bound to fail. So by definition, what we should do instead is look for the malicious behaviors. Because by definition, malware does anomalous things. So let's leverage this fact with the goal of generically detecting uh, even repurposed Mac malware threats. Because again, as we said, when we or an attacker repurposes any malware, we're really not changing its capabilities or its functionalities. Maybe just some bytes. All right, so let's start with persistence, detecting that. 
the majority of Mac malware, including the samples we talked about repurposing today, are going to persist so that when the system is rebooted, they get automatically re-executed. So it's actually very easy to detect persistence. You just monitor the file system, observing known locations of persistence. And then when something writes to that, you can detect that it's just persisted. So here, for example, we can now generically detect when Wintail, either the original or the repurposed sample, goes to persist. We can also detect when malware, for example, accesses the mic or the webcam. Uh, a lot of Mac malware does this, including the fruit fly, fruit fly sample we talked about repurposing today. Turns out, again, it's pretty easy to detect this. Uh, Mac OS will broadcast a notification anytime an application accesses the mic or the webcam. So if you're writing a security tool, you can simply register for that notification. And then when anything accesses the webcam, for example, Fruitfly, either the original or the repurposed version, you will get a notification and you can then detect that activity. We also want to be able to detect keyloggers because a lot of malware will try to capture your key presses to get uh, passwords, credit card information, et cetera, et cetera. Similar to uh, webcam and mic, uh, Mac OS will broadcast a notification anytime a new piece of software tries to start capturing keys. Uh, so what we can do is we can monitor for this notification. And then even if a malware sample that has been repurposed starts capturing key keystrokes, we will get this notification and then say, OK, hey, this is something strange. This is, looks like uh, a piece of malware. Malware, uh, and I talked about this uh, yesterday when I talked about uh, synthetic clicks. Uh, often has the ability to generate programmatic mouse clicks to interact with the UI of an infected system. Luckily, and we kind of covered this briefly yesterday as well, we can generically detect uh, synthetic events as well. What we can do on the system, for example, in a security tool, we can register for our own event tap. Then anytime a mouse click is generated, we can check to see if it's synthetically generated. So now this means if Fruitfly has somehow gotten onto a system that's running our tool uh, and is generating these synthetic clicks, for example, to click on access and security prompts, uh, our tool will now detect that. And we don't care if it's the original sample or the repurposed sample. Because we're focusing on behaviors, we will detect uh, either. So at the start of the talk, I mentioned I'm the creator uh, of Objective-C. Objective-C has a wide range of free open source uh, Mac security products, uh, including ones that implement these detections we talked about today. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of security tools and detecting Mac OS threats, uh, check out Objective-C.com. Now, a downside, quote, quote, to these Objective-C tools is that they are all separate. They each do their own thing, right? There's one for keylogger detection. There's one that detects uh, firewalls. There's one that does uh, mic and webcam modification. So when I started working at Digita, I said, hey, let's create an all-in-one version of the tool that implements these behavior detections so that we can ideally generically detect even repurposed Mac malware. And the idea was pretty simple. We first monitor the system, for example, watching for persistence events, keylogger events, mic webcam access. And then what we do is we create rules to detect unusual logic, and we feed both of those into Apple's built-in game engine, which very efficiently and very uh, quickly can evaluate the rules onto our input, our monitor data, and then output the result. So now I want to briefly talk about some of these behavior-based detection rules. And it's important to note it's not specific to our tool. You can utilize these in other tools as well. So using the system, for example, we can generically and rather trivially detect even repurposed malware. So for example, for Wintail, we can now generically detect its exploitation vector by simply observing the fact that Safari has downloaded and auto-extracted an application. This same application has triggered the registration of a custom URL. And then finally, the application is then automatically started to handle that custom URL. So what we can do is we can detect the combination of these three events. And this gives us a powerful detection capability that, again, allows us to detect either Wintail's original exploit or even a repurposed version. Similarly, we can also now detect Fruitfly, again, the original or the repurposed version, or similar malware by cumulatively observing the fact that a hidden launch item 
was created that generates a, uh, that executes a non-Apple binary, right? This is something very unusual, very anomalous, that's likely indicative of malware. Now imagine Fruitfly has already been installed. We can detect Fruitfly, either the original sample or the repurposed one, by simply monitoring for and detecting various runtime behaviors. So Fruitfly does odd things like uh, running a hidden process, that's not normal, uh, dropping an unsigned binary and then executing that out of temp. Again, that's rather unusual. And then, as we mentioned, also generates synthetic clicks, which, again, that's not something that's normally going to happen on an uninfected system. So we can either detect and cumulatively trigger on all of these, or we can individually look for these. We can say, OK, perhaps I'm interested any time something is executed out of temp. That's fine. So that is kind of how we can generically detect uh, those repurposed threats. So this wraps up the talk. Uh, hopefully, I've illustrated why repurposing Mac Mauer is an excellent idea if you are a black hat hacker or work for uh, a group that's doing offensive cyber operations. Uh, in my opinion, it's way better to simply let someone do all the hard work and then repurpose it for yourself. Uh, we mentioned the other benefit of this, it's going to kind of muddy attribution. Uh, if it does get caught, you know, it's probably going to be someone else that gets the, the blame, not you. And then finally, we ended by showing that you know, we really need to focus, uh, instead of signature-based detection approaches, using these heuristic behavior-based. Uh, because this will allow us to generically detect either the original malware samples or the repurposed ones. So again, thank you for attending my talk. And again, I want to extend a thank you to the Echo Party crew for organizing this uh, amazing conference. So let's give them, again, a round of applause. Gracias.